Welcome to part nine of the video history of Rossmar. I'm John Nutley, your narrator. Looking at the period from 1990 to 1995, we notice the coming together of various segments of the population. We came together to honor and celebrate. They came together to resolve difficulties and decide issues. They came together to care for one another and enjoy life in Rossmore. Many issues unresolved in part eight were settled in this period. We begin this story with our participation in the Persian Gulf War. The Gulf War and the liberation of Kuwait made headlines even in Rossmar. There arose a desire to be part of the tribute to our troops on their return. In January 1991, planning began. We would adopt a ship and have a party for the officers and crew. In April, Operation Yellow Ribbon began under the leadership of Phil Freeman, a naval unit operating out of the Concord Naval Weapons Station would be arriving in June. The USS Flint, operating as an ammunition transport, had made several voyages to the Persian Gulf. The ship's captain, Commander Alan Thompson, was contacted and he welcomed the opportunity for his vessel to be adopted by the residents of Rossmore. Work was begun immediately to arrange for a proper celebration and to give thanks for their contribution to the war efforts. Residents contribute funds for a recreational gift for the crew. Businesses and food vendors were solicited for supplies to feed 1,500 people and the festivities. The response was great. U.S. flags and yellow ribbons were the principal decoration. Special badges were distributed. The exact date was left flexible due to military travel. Originally planned for May, the date was reset for June 14, 1991. The committee, headed by Phil Freeman, met the ship at Concord and welcomed them home and invited the crew to the party. The sudden death of Phil Freeman did not stop the party. Lee Blodgett stepped forward and took over. On June 14th, over 300 sailors and their wives and families descended on the welcoming Karasmorians wearing yellow ribbons and waving U.S. flags. The sailors were delighted and surprised by the Rossmore reception. The official welcome was held in the Court of Flags. Then in Gateway Clubhouse, refreshments featuring hot dogs Coke and cake were served to all. A gift of $3,000 was added to the Flint's Recreation Fund, and a plaque was presented for installation on the bulkhead. Mayor Gwen Regalia of Walnut Creek presented a proclamation of welcome. The official record of Operation Yellow Ribbon now resides in the historical archives of the society. The dispute between the various mutuals and the Golden Rain Foundation came to be resolved during the early 1990s. In previous episodes, we discussed the conflict between First Walnut Creek Mutual and the Golden Rain Foundation regarding the management of the mutual. First Walnut Creek Mutual contended that GRF was not servicing the mutual properly. It had demanded changes, and when they were not forthcoming, canceled the management agreement. There followed a number of accusations and lawsuits, which resulted in a judgment in favor of First Walnut Creek Mutual. In this episode, we will examine the tentative decision of Judge Sabra, the settlement procedures, and the resolution of unresolved issues. With the judge's decision not in favor of GRF, Cecil Riley resigned as general manager. In April 1990, Bob Boyer was appointed to replace him. This came as Judge Chabra presented his final decision. 
that required that the trust allocations and the mutual allocations must be separated. In any future dis disputes, the mutuals must work together through Human and Urban Development Office. In July, GRF sent First Walnut Creek Mutual one check to cover all outstanding costs. First Walnut Creek Mutual refused to accept it as it did not identify the accounts. Separate checks were needed for each claim in conformity to the court's decision. New checks were sent and accepted by First Walnut Creek Mutual. In August, First Walnut Creek Mutual sent out to each manor checks for $200 from the money received from GRF's machinery and equipment fund. First Walnut Creek Mutual's total receipts have now reached $1.1 million. To recover its cost, GRF proposed to assess the other residents $240 per manor. This was eventually rejected. It also sued Sherman Williams for improper paint, for which they received $175,000. The other area of concern was the accounting practices. In November 1992, First Walnut Creek Mutual voiced its uncertainties and asked for arbitration. It still wanted to see the separation of the trust account from the management service account. Insurance, pension funds, accounting, and methods of allocation were also concerned. No real organization, as required by the court decision, had yet been made. By June 1993, still no action and arbitration had failed. First Walnut Creek Mutual then sued GRF. Both sides felt that they, the other had not acted honorably. In July, GRF separated the funds and the sides returned to the bargaining table. It was not until May of 1994 that all issues were resolved satisfactorily. First Walnut Creek received an additional $100,000 in settlement. Thus ended First Walnut Creek's pursuit with GRF management. It would continue to use Caldwell Bankers as management agent for several years. Golden Rain Foundation had already begun to examine its operation to develop procedures for reorganization. Second and third Walnut Creek Mutuals looked at their agreement with GRF. In July of 1991, Second Walnut Creek Mutual notified GRF that it would terminate its agreement in two years. Second and third Walnut Creek Mutuals formed the Mutual Services Committee with Len Hedberg as chair to establish new standards for service. Mutual 8 joined them and also announced its intention to terminate its contract. GRF and its desire to remain as management agent released Hal Menges of its business operation to be their consultant. Through 1992, the Mutual Services Committee worked on requirements for service. In September, 3rd Walnut Creek Mutual explained the results of their study. On November 18th, GRF hired Steve Adams, who had worked on the Mutual Services Committee, to head its new maintenance services department. In 1993, the separation of trust operation and mutual operations were completed. Separate budgets were prepared for each mutual other than First Walnut Creek Mutual. In June, new management agreements were signed by GRF and Second Walnut Creek Mutual and Third Walnut Creek Mutual. Margaret Grant, the new president of GRF, was instrumental in reaching the accord. Mutual 8, meanwhile, had signed with CB Commercial Management Services Caldwell Banker. Second and third Walnut Creek Mutuals continued to be concerned about charges for services. Discussions were to continue for several months. In March of 1994, GRF reported an overrun of $1.7 million. 
numerous complaints led to the revelation of accounting technical errors. Procedures were developed to eliminate the problem in the future. By April of 1994, maintenance costs assignments had been reached between GRF and the several mutuals. The Joint Mutual Board, which for many years had governed and decided how the mutual shared expenses were divided, began a reorganization process. It would no longer perform such actions by court ruling as it was an infringement on each mutual board's responsibility. They proposed to become an advisory and prepared new bylaws. In March of 1994, a new joint mutual board was elected. After a series of public meetings, the new bylaws were approved. In May of 1994, Ben Wisner, noted for his financial skills, was elected to replace Margaret Grant as GRF president. Most of the difficulties that had plagued the mutuals and GRF for almost 10 years had been set to rest. Various boards look forward to the calmer years ahead. The fifth clubhouse problem had concerned GRF and the builders since the decision of 1973. Now in this period, the residents came together to decide on the location of the clubhouse and the adjacent land. In the previous episode, we discussed the possibility of Golden Rain Foundation purchasing all of the Del Valle Club High School property. This idea was put aside when the asking price was too high. The playing fields, the swimming pool, and the gymnasium did become part of the Rossmore picture. They became the basis for the Del Valle Clubhouse. Plans were proposed for the remodeling of the building to include a large event auditorium, a kitchen, an exercise area, and lockers for the pool area. The existing pools were rebuilt to satisfy the needs of seniors. A large parking lot was laid out. Several community meetings were held to receive input from the residents. With the plans in place, the Golden Rain Foundation allocated two and a half million dollars for the project. Work progressed for over a year. By mid-July of 1993, the new clubhouse was nearing completion. In August, there was a preview showing for GRF prior to adding the finishing touches. Finally, on October 6, the official opening took place. 2,000 residents visited the new clubhouse and gave their approval. The new fitness center proved so popular that it was necessary to expand it and add additional pieces of equipment. The total cost for the Del Valle Clubhouse was finalized at $6,718,000. This included the price of the property. The Akalana School District had divided the high school property into seven parcels. Our clubhouse was Lot 1. Waterford was Lot 2. Lots 4 and 6 were subjects of dispute between UDC Homes and the manor care, which we will discuss later. There was some interest in lot seven, as it contained the classrooms and the auditorium. They could be used by the residents and the staff for workshops. The city would take the land along Tice Valley Boulevard. In 1994, the executive director suggested that we return to the possible purchase of parcel seven. A binding vote of the membership was proposed. GRF authorized a study of the area and $50,000 was set aside for the work. Parcel 7 contained 20 acres. It had eight buildings. $3.1 million was the agreed price with Akalanas High School District. A geological survey indicated that the land was subject to seismic activity. The unstable ground was in the area away from the building that GRF wished to modify. 
The unstable ground would be left in a natural state. The city of Walnut Creek decided not to go with the proposed purchase. The question now became, did Golden Rain Foundation want to purchase it on its own? A loan would be required, which would be paid for from new member fees. The Rossmore Residents Association opposed the purchase as unnecessary and unrequired. In October, the GRF received the report of the study committee and plans for a resident vote was scheduled. This was interrupted by the announcement that UDC Homes was in financial difficulties. This could mean there would be no new residence fees to finance the purchase because there would be no one bit to build new manors. A series of public hearings were planned to discuss the entire issue. Then in January of 1995, the vote was canceled when GRF discovered the extent of UDC Homes' financial difficulties. The opposition had grown and it looked like the issue would be defeated. UDC Homes underwent reconstructuring, but that failed to save the company, and in mid-May it declared bankruptcy under Chapter 11. In June, GRF held a special meeting to discuss Parcel 7 in detail. It decided not to exercise its option to buy. So after seven years, Parcel 7 was no longer a Rossmore possibility. Along with the concerns for the fifth clubhouse was the issue of a nursing facility. While the issue was primarily between Manor Care and UDC Homes, it did involve Rossmoreans. As originally planned, passage to the medical facility would go through Rossmore. For many years, residents had been calling for some type of nursing facility for Rossmoreans. It would serve those returning from the hospital or recuperating from illnesses or accidents. In the breakup of the Del Valle High School property by the school district, one of the lots was purchased by Manor Healthcare for a medical facility. In order to serve the proposed facilities, its personnel would need entrance rights through Rossmore. The Golden Rain president signed a letter of agreement permitting usage of the streets. This was opposed by the residents. A class action suit was initiated by nine Ross Marines referred to as Adler et al. against GRF, UDC Homes, and Manor Care. The easement right was the core of the controversy and propelled the controversy over the next three years. At a town meeting in August 1991, a large turnout of residents opposed the location of a nursing facility in Rossmore. The Joint Mutual Board sponsored a ballot. The vote was 4,140 to 267 against. The residents did not want the facility inside Rossmore. It was now proposed that UDC Homes and Manor Care exchanged lots. In April 1992, Manor Care went to court and sued UDC Homes for $2.8 million. As lot four was not suitable for the purpose of its purchase, the possibility of a road through Waterford area was suggested, but rejected by the Golden Rain Board. In July, Manor Care again suggested a swap of Lot 4 for Lot 6 with access to the nursing facility from Tice Valley Boulevard. Early in July of 92, the Adler suit against the Golden Rain Foundation was dismissed by the Second District Court. Adler would appeal. The suit against UDC Homes and Manor Care remained to be decided. The city of Walnut Creek added its voice to the controversy, suggesting Manor Care move to Lot 6. Walnut Creek wanted it resolved. Manor Care, eager for action, now sued Golden Rain Foundation 
for access to Lot 4. It hoped to force UDC Homes to resolve the issue. For the rest of the year, there seemed to be no visible work towards a solution. Then in January of 93, UDC Homes introduced the possibility of a skilled nursing facility on Lot 6. Meeting with representatives of Walnut Creek, Manor Care, Golden Rain, and UDC showed common interest in the swap of the two lots. The acreage of the two lots was the basis of the differences that needed to be resolved. The lot sizes were 12.4 acres and 4.3 acres. If Manor Care would consider a smaller size facility, a solution might be reached. Then in June, a compromise was reached. Manor Care would build its nursing facility on Lot 6 with an entrance on Tice Valley Boulevard. UDC Homes would build on Lot 4 and part of Lot 6. This evened out the land swap. The details were worked out with the help of the Walnut Creek Mayor, Gene Wolfe, who resided in Rossmore. The new plan was presented to the Planning Commission for approval. UDC Homes would build 25 units on Lot 6 and 19 on Lot 4. Manor Care would have room for 120 beds in its new facility. The City Council approved the changes after a public hearing. Now all the parties were satisfied. The Adler et al. suit was won by GRF. The undeveloped areas of Rossmore were lands at the south end of the valley and along the East Ridge. The controversy was to be resolved by the coming together of all parties, including the city of Walnut Creek, to find the necessary compromises. While the controversy over the location of the nursing facility was raging, UDC Homes was developing its plans for Neighborhood 4 and Neighborhood 9. Neighborhood 4 on the south end of the valley required a large amount of earth movement, laying of electrical, water, sewage, and drainage lines. When the residents of Rossmer heard that some 3,100 trees were to be removed and replaced with housing units, there was an uproar. Most of these trees were small scrub oak. The conservationists were not satisfied until UDC Homes promised to plant a like number of trees as the housing units were completed. Pinnacle Ridge, as the project was called, was to take several years to complete. Neighborhood 9 on the East Ridge also involved extensive earth movement. Hills would be topped and the valleys filled. Opposition was to come mainly from people who lived to the east of Rossmore on Castle Ridge. They were concerned about their view and the drainage problem during the winter rains. Some Rossmoreans who lived high on the west side of the valley also expressed opposition. The city of Walnut Creek put several restrictions that needed to be met prior to the issuance of building permits. This had included a reduction in the number of units allowed Construction could only be south of the high power lines. The number was reduced to 789 manors, then to 434, and finally to 235. The heights of the buildings were limited to two floors and must conform to the slope. When all restrictions were met, construction of Eagle Ridge could begin. It would take more than seven years to complete these large units. By then, the work was done by another builder. For most residents, life in Rossmore did not rotate around these issues. They were more concerned about coming together to enjoy life. Let us look at some of these activities that illustrate this coming together. Rossmore had come together to celebrate and honor our troops in the Persian Gulf War. The celebration showed what could be done 
to cooperation. They now turn to more mundane activities. The swimmers swam in the pools and frolicked in group sports. For the lawn bowlers and the golfers, the green lawns and the warm days made chasing the ball an enjoyable way to spend the day. The lawn bowlers even hosted the U.S. Lawn Bowling Championships. Players from various states and countries vied for trophies. The golfers were proud of their new Creekside Clubhouse. The Pro Shop and the Fairway Room were fine additions to the community. The tennis players eagerly challenged each other on the new courts in the Buckeye Grove south of Tice Creek Drive. One group that wanted more space for play was the bridge players. As bridge is played every day, they requested a dedicated room for card playing. Another group that sought expansion were the library goers. The Lost Moore Library was cramped and shelf space was limited. They hoped to find space in any new building GRF plan. The Recreation Department to continue to find and expand the services it offered. Day trips and longer trips were planned and rapidly filled. An example was a day trip to Apple Valley. Rossmarians brought baked apple pies, turnovers, and apple fritters. The Fourth of July was celebrated with enthusiasm, with fun and games, prizes and food, music and entertainment in the Court of Flags and the Dollar Picnic Grounds. The Flea Market, Activities Day, and the Fall Bazaar, and the Health Fair were all ways of bringing the residents together to show off what they could do or make and raise funds for their favorite causes. But they all took a back seat to Rossmore's 30th anniversary celebration. In 1994, under the leadership of Eileen Ward, a variety of activities were planned. The Rotary Club organized a parade which circled the block, it included golf cars, fancy cars, marching bands, and colorful floats. The Rossmore News took a series of pictures which showed the residents in various activities. These were published in a special edition of the Rossmore News. The photo display covered all the things that people did from dawn to dusk and beyond. It showed what a wonderful place Rossmore is and what opportunities are available to the residents. As we come to the end of this episode, we find Rossmore coming together to enrich their lives with activities, boasting of their accomplishment, and perhaps looking forward to other improvements that we will discover in our next episodes. Until we meet again, this is John Nutley thanking you for your attention to this episode and your coming together of Ross Morians.